In the summer of 1962, a small hunting party of Inupiat spotted something strange in the Arctic waters of the Beaufort Sea. Amid the shifting ice and snow was a large ship, drifting aimlessly in the waters ahead of them and locked within layers of thick Arctic ice. No smoke rose from her funnels, no navigation lights twinkled on her mast, in fact no signs of life emanated from her at all. The ship was abandoned, but what's more, it had been drifting out here alone for almost 40 years. The ship that the Inupiat had seen was the Beichimo, a famous local legend, a cargo ship that had been drifting alone for 38 years. After being abandoned in 1931, stuck fast in the grip of the ice, the Beichimo would undertake its ghostly voyage thousands of miles throughout the Arctic seas, occasionally being spotted and boarded by curious fishermen or hunters as she earned her reputation as the most famous ghost ship of the Arctic. I've always thought that the Beichimo is the most incredible example of a true ghost ship, a ship that disappeared in the night, only to reappear numerous times, not just over the years, but over the decades, appearing out of the mist and then disappearing back into the strange, enigmatic landscapes of the Arctic Oceans. But the story of the Beichimo has always been so much more than that of a ghost ship to me. It was a pioneer, a harbinger of a new way of life up in the remote communities of the far Alaskan and Canadian North, and its unique design is probably what stopped it from sinking when it became trapped in the ice in 1931. But what is the true story of the Beichimo? How did it survive? Where did it go? And where, perhaps, is it now? The Beichimo started her life in Sweden, launched at the Lindholm shipyard in Gothenburg in 1915, and named after one of Sweden's largest rivers, the Ong... <sighs> Okay, in Swedish, slowly, you would just say Ångerman Elven. These early blueprints of the Ångerman Elven show the layout of the ship. She was 330 feet long, made up of three large cargo holds, with a navigation bridge located amidships and powered by three coal-fired Lindholm steam engines at the rear, giving the 1,322-ton steamer a cruising speed of around 8 to 9 knots. While her design was relatively typical, what made the Ångerman Elven's construction so distinctive was her ice strengthening. She was built for the cold waters of the Baltic Sea, and so, as the blueprints describe, mid-ribbing for ice reinforcement was added. Essentially, extra ribs added along the length of her hull to help withstand the crushing forces of ice. She was also fitted with a more rounded bluff bow that could help the ship ride up upon and break through sheets of ice. It was this strong, well-built hull that allowed the ship to operate in frozen winter seas while other ships remained tied up in port, and it would also be the key to her survival and longevity in the Arctic decades later. The Ongerman Alvin would serve her German owners on this Baltic route throughout World War I, until she, along with all German vessels over 800 tons, were confiscated by Allied nations as part of war reparations. She was transferred to the British government and soon snapped up by the Hudson Bay Company, who saw the clear advantages that her sturdy, ice-capable construction could offer to their trading voyages in the far north of America. As this document from 1921 details, it was also here she gained the name SS Bay Chimo, named after Fort Chimo one of the Hudson Bay Company's remote trading posts, and the word Chimo also being a form of greeting amongst the Inuit. Leaving Cardiff in June 1921, the Bay Chimo would immediately be put to work. In just a few short years, this small tramp steamer would first cross the Atlantic, working her way up the treacherous eastern coastlines of Canada, calling at remote trading outposts and ports where few ships of her size had ever ventured. Upon returning to Britain from this inaugural Canadian voyage, she would then cross to yet another remote and untamed region, the north of Siberia. The Beichimo was to pass through the Panama Canal, sailing to the Siberian coastlines along the Bering Strait, where the Hudson Bay Company hoped to establish trading outposts with the new Soviet government. It was a difficult and treacherous voyage for the Beichimo. The small ship tossed about and nearly swamped in storms on her crossing, grounded and trapped in ice while navigating the harsh Siberian coastlines, and, in one case, almost boarded and detained by the newly installed and dangerously unpredictable Soviet authorities. In just two years, these long, arduous journeys had already taken their toll on the small and tough steamer. Despite all these challenges, however, the bruised and battered Beichimo chugged along relentlessly, the ship and her crew transporting vast multitudes of varied cargoes to and from some of the most remote coastlines in the Northern Hemisphere. Following these early adventures, however, the Beichimo would now set sail for a new posting, a place where no ship of her kind had ever been before. 
For centuries, whaling ships, trading vessels and explorers had braved the far Alaskan and Canadian north, but the unpredictable seas, thick flows of ice and plunging temperatures had brought numerous ships over the years to their doom. In fact, just as the Bay Chimo had arrived in Vancouver, another Hudson Bay Company ship, the Lady Kinserley, had been caught fast by the ice near Barrow, Alaska as she made her way north for a trading mission. The Lady Kinserley had been built especially for service in the Arctic. She featured an enormously strong close-ribbed hull made of wood to help better sustain the punishing flexing effects of the crushing ice. But even this was not enough. After several failed attempts at rescue, the crew were eventually forced to abandon her, and the ship, held firm by the grip of the ice, drifted off into the Arctic seas, never to be seen again. It was an ominous sign for the newly arrived Bay Chimo. No ship of iron or steel had ever made it past the most northerly point battle. But now, with the loss of the Kinserley, it would be the Bay Chimo, tasked with reaching these far-off outposts and communities that had gone without supply for almost two years. As well as delivering essential supplies, she would also be there to collect the vast riches of furs gathered from within the Hudson Bay Company's colossal territory, one which had made her shareholders and investors back home incredibly wealthy. Today's sponsor, however, deals with a very different kind of trade than furs, that of fine art. But rather than locked off to rich investors and millionaires, it's designed for people like you and I. Masterworks has assembled teams of data scientists, art insiders and financial experts, all with the shared mission of giving us the chance to invest and reap the benefits of fine art's remarkable potential for appreciation. Except, Masterworks lets us do it without having to spend millions. Since their inception, Masterworks have a track record of positive net returns 100% of the time, from paintings that are qualified with the SEC and offered as shares for us. This way you can invest an amount that fits your goals and see the benefit of net returns like 10, 13 and even 35%. It's no wonder then that Masterworks new offerings can sell out in just hours and they have a waitlist designed to manage such traffic. But by using my link below you'll get priority access right away to skip that waitlist and to invest in a highly beneficial and rewarding area of history and culture. Thanks again Masterworks and let's get back to the Bay Chimo. Despite her strengthened steel hull and bluff bow, few knew whether the Bechimo would be able to survive the journey, a punishing route in which she would have to force her way through the summer ice round Point Barrow and then east, down the coastline into Canada's western Arctic and all the way to Cambridge Bay, almost halfway back towards the Atlantic Ocean. Amazingly, to those who doubted they would ever see the Bay Chimo return when she left Vancouver in the summer of 1925, on October 22nd she steamed back into port, battered and bruised from a punishing journey that led her thousands of miles through the Northwest Passage and into Cambridge Bay, landing at countless stops along the way and back again. The sturdy, unassuming Bay Chimo had achieved what no steel ship before her had been able to do, traversing some of the most extreme and unpredictable seas on Earth, and in only a few short months, she would be heading back to do it all over again. Over the next several years, the Bechimo would set about on a regular service into the Alaskan and Canadian wilderness, leaving from Vancouver in the summer with her decks stacked high with everything from food and lumber to typewriters and medicine, and often a small number of passengers. What would then follow were weeks of delicate manoeuvring through ice fields, docking at remote outposts and communities to deposit or collect cargo, and then racing all the way back out of the Arctic before the winter and the enroaching ice closed in. The Bay Chimo, leaving Vancouver resplendent at the start of the season, would usually return battered and bruised, frequently missing parts from her propeller or with extensive hull damage due to becoming trapped or entangled in the ice. The Bay Chimo would then often make the arduous journey all the way back to her home port of Ardrossan in Scotland, where her crews would be paid off or receive a few weeks of leave before the journey began again. In 1931, the Bechimo was ready to set out for her sixth summer voyage into the Arctic Ocean, but early signs showed it would not be an easy journey. Crossing over the Arctic Circle on July 25th, far heavier ice than usual was flowing in from the north, slowing their progress at every turn. It would be the 21st of August before they reached Point Barrow, a date which they were normally due in Cambridge Bay, still some 2,000 miles to the east. 
Realising that this exceptionally heavy ice was delaying progress, the Bechimo was ordered to turn back from her voyage early at Copper Mine. Even this now shortened itinerary was cutting it too close, however. The Bechimo had battled through thick ice to reach Point Barrow, but it was now the 18th of September. Ice was closing in, openings and channels of water were becoming smaller and harder to find, and the now frozen Bering Strait was still to be crossed. Her captain, Sidney Cornwell, who had helmed the ship since its time in Siberia, had never overwintered the Beichimo in the Arctic and had little desire to do so now. But he was also well aware of how just one mistake could doom both the ship and its nearly $50,000 worth of valuable cargo. Despite the efforts of Cornwell and his crew, by the 24th of September the Beichimo was almost immobile. There was only enough coal left in the bunkers for nine days steaming, and on the 29th visiting locals gave them yet more bad news. The Bering Strait ahead of them was thick with ice, and the seas behind them were almost frozen solid. By the 8th of October, now increasingly at the mercy of the surrounding ice, gales were starting to blow the Beichimo close to shore, threatening to ground the ship in the inhospitable coastline. The Beichimo was trapped, and Cornwall had to finally admit defeat. The ship was going nowhere until the seas began to thaw. That is, of course, should the Beichimo, trapped as she was within the grip of the ice and perilously close to the shore, survive the winter. Preparations were soon made for overwintering on the ice. Out of the 32 souls now trapped on board, non-essential crew and passengers would have to be evacuated. But a number of crew, including Captain Cornwell, would have to stay behind to ensure the Beichimo and cargo were secure and hopefully free her in the following year. The Beichimo's position was now relatively stable and secure, but because of the stranglehold the ice held over her, it would not be safe for the crew to stay on board for the winter. Accommodation would therefore have to be built on the shoreline, and soon the crews were removing timber from the holds to construct a large accommodation block, as well as a makeshift runway for the remaining passengers and crew to be flown out. On October 15th, the first of these planes arrived, battling the Arctic conditions to collect passengers, crew, and perhaps most importantly, the valuable Hudson Bay Company books and records. Cornwell and 16 men remained behind, moving into the makeshift accommodation block towards the end of October, and preparing for their long wait until the Beichimo might finally be freed. Newspapers of the time excitedly reported on the conditions of the trapped sailors, stuck in a perilous position next to their frozen ship, and attempting to ride out this harsh Arctic winter. The crew, meanwhile, remained relatively well supplied by local traders, and the small community of Wainwright was reachable only a few miles down the coast to the south. The wireless radio set from the ship had been moved into the accommodation block, and regular supplies, including mail and even newspapers, were able to be brought to the stranded sailors. With the ship now somewhat secure and the crews comfortable inside their hut, for a while it seemed as if the Beichimo and her icebound caretakers may be able to comfortably ride out the winter, and the sturdy Swedish ship might survive yet another close encounter with the Arctic. However, by November 18th, the sun finally dipped under the horizon, plunging the landscape into months of almost complete darkness, save for a few hours of dim twilight each day. The weather also worsened, and on the 24th of November, a huge storm raged over the landscape, trapping the crew inside their shoreside cabin. Once the storm finally abated, the crew staggered out to see what had survived and what condition the Beichimo herself was in. Huge flows had been thrown up upon the shore, creating mountains of ice some 70 feet high. However, as the crew clambered over them to try and reach the ship, they were shocked to find an empty white horizon. The Beichimo, which had been so trapped within the ice only days previously, had now disappeared. So the Beichimo had disappeared, but the crew quite sensibly assumed she was probably now sitting on the seabed. Remember, this wasn't an uncommon occurrence for ships operating in the Arctic. Also remember that the Lady Kinserley, the ship that the Beichimo had replaced, had been lost in the ice in a very similar way. Um, it had become trapped in the ice for months. The crew were eventually forced to abandon it. It was the Beichimo that actually came to the crew's aid in the end. And the crew never actually saw the Lady Kinserley sink. She drifted off in an ice pack and was presumably crushed, holed in some way, and then sunk to the seabed. So the same fate, they assumed, had probably befallen the Beichimo. And what's interesting is, not only did the crew think that, so did the media of the time. There's this really interesting time period in which we see media reports pop up about the famous Beichimo now having sunk. Remember, the Beichimo was pretty famous back then. It had become trapped in the ice before. The current story of it being trapped in the ice and the crew stuck on the shoreline and their temporary accommodation was really exciting. It also travelled to Siberia and to the far Canadian north, uh, uh, past and around Alaska. So there was a lot of news coverage 
coverage each year of the Beichimo and her exploits, and she was pretty well known. And that's why this is really fascinating. I don't have many kind of uh, artifacts of the time. I've got this newspaper article from 1947, you know, several years later. Um, but this one is from the time, and I find it really fascinating. Now, you'll notice it doesn't have a picture of the Beichimo. <laughs> it's a picture of, uh, as it actually details in the back, a walrus hunt. Um, but this was sent out to newspapers by um, a newswire. So if you look up news stories from around this time period, just after she had been lost in that storm, you'll find often this photo um, with an accompanying piece of text talking about how the Beichimo has been sunk. And the the best thing, the thing that I love the most about this, it actually has the original typewritten news story printed on the back here. Uh, and you can see um, International Newsreel uh, Photo San Francisco Bureau, so that's where it was uh, being dispatched from. And it says here, the steamer Bay Chimo, frozen fast with its $1 million cargo of fur in the Alaskan pack north of Wainwright last September, has now been ground to bits by enormous flows. Uh, and then it says further down, this news brought in dispatches from Alaska marks the end of the Bay Chimo's long and adventurous career in the icy north of America, Asia and Europe. Um, I think I mean, I love this. I think it's so amazing. You can actually see on the date here, um, 12th, uh, th of course, it's American date format, it's 3rd of December, 1931. And I think to me, this is such an amazing piece of history because imagine being, you know, somebody who reads the newspaper back then who was following the news of this Bay Chimo, this ship that had been trapped out in the Arctic. You'd been following for weeks the exploits of the crew trapped there on the Alaskan shore waiting for their ship to be freed. Maybe you'd heard about the Bay Chimo in years past and all her other various exploits. And then you finally read this. Ice wins final victory. The Bechimo has been lost to the ice. But only a few weeks later, you would open the newspaper and find that the Bechimo had actually survived. Over a week later, miles up the coastline from Captain Cornwall's camp, local trader Ollie Morris spotted an unusual shape amongst the jagged cliffs of ice. As he got closer, he realised that it was, incredibly, the Bechimo, still stuck fast within the ice and at the mercy of wherever it was carrying her. Climbing up a tattered rope ladder, Morris wandered the abandoned decks of the eerie, once busy ship and managed to salvage as many of the furs from the Beichimo's hold as he could carry, hoping to return them to the Hudson Bay Company for reward. Reaching Captain Cornwall's camp, Morris informed them of what he had found, but by the time they could reach the ship themselves, the weather and misty seas had reclaimed her once again. On the 12th of February 1932, finally giving up their search, the remaining crew who had stood watch over the Beichimo for so many weeks were flown out like the passengers and crew before them, leaving behind the ship that had served them so well for the last 11 years and no doubt wondering what her eventual fate may be. Incredibly, against the predictions of many, the harsh winter did not crush or sink the Beichimo and, trapped within the grip of the ice, she continued to move with the ever-shifting currents and ice flows of the Arctic seas and was spotted and boarded numerous times. In March 1932, she was spotted close to shore, where explorer Leslie Melvin found her in good condition, with no noticeable damage or holes in her hull. In April, she was boarded by local Inupiat, where stories began to circulate that the ghost ship had trapped them on board for days or weeks at a time as she carried them off deeper into the Arctic seas. Another sighting placed her hundreds of miles to the northeast of her last known position, showing the vast distances that the ice was carrying her with every passing week and month. Newspapers were now buzzing with stories of the elusive ghost ship Beichimo. Rumours started to circulate of millions of dollars worth of cargo in her hold, far more than the actual $50,000 worth Captain Cornwall had documented, but further exciting newspapers and potential treasure hunters. In February 1930, flying ace Edna Christofferson set off by air to try and find the ship and its apparent riches, only to end up stranded on a remote frozen lake for days. Those lucky few who did find the Beichimo in her occasional appearances in the ice usually recovered far less valuable items inside. Over the months and years, traders, local Inuit and explorers picked over the ship for trinkets and souvenirs, but generally marvelled at her remarkably good condition, with fuel still on board for her boilers and still seaworthy despite all the years drifting alone. In one of the most unusual cases, in December 1932, Richard Finney, a crew member on board the ship when she was lost, amazingly received a letter from the Beichimo, one that had been left behind when it was abandoned and which had been found by an Inuit who had climbed aboard the ship, recovered the letter and then sent it all the way home to England. 
Stories and sightings like this had by the mid to late 1930s established the Beichimo as a local legend, the elusive ghost ship that many locals eagerly waited for each season to appear on the horizon, much like how in a previous life they had awaited her arrival each summer bringing supplies and cargoes to remote communities along the Alaskan and Canadian coastlines. But by the end of the 1930s, reports and sightings of the ship had waned. Interestingly, when mapped, confirmed sightings of the Beichimo peaked in the early years of her disappearance, usually around the area that she had originally become trapped. Sightings then almost faded to nothing, before reappearing in multiple sightings decades later around the 1960s. Accounts are hard to verify, but some of the most far afield sightings occurred throughout the Arctic, from Cambridge Bay to a bizarre reported sighting in the North Atlantic Ocean during the Second World War. War. But by the 1960s, when sightings began to re-emerge, most were reported around where the Bechimo had first been abandoned. The possible explanation behind this is a phenomenon known as transpolar drift. While the far frozen reaches of the Arctic may seem stationary, they do in fact exist in a constant state of flux, moved by powerful currents that can continuously shift ice flows and anything caught within their grip for thousands of miles. One of the most famous examples is the USS Jeanette, commanded by George DeLong in his ill-fated expedition to the North Pole in the early 1880s. In 1881, the Jeanette was crushed in the ice in the East Siberian Sea, but just three years later, wreckage from the Jeanette was discovered in the southwest of Greenland, indicating that the wreckage had been moved thousands of miles throughout the Arctic seas at the hands of ocean currents. It was this wreckage that inspired Fridtjof Nansen to cross the Arctic in the Fram, a specially designed ship to ride up upon the ice pack and take advantage of this newly theorised transpolar drift, with the Fram and her crew eventually travelling all the way from Siberia to the Atlantic Ocean. When trapped, the Beichimo's crew noted numerous times that the Beichimo had been pushed up far off the ice, just like the Fram, and held within a large and deep iceberg. Photos from 1933, years after her abandonment, still show this to be the case. And in this position, it could be many years before summer sun or warmer waters would be able to free the ship, or alternatively, for the ice to crush and sink it. What's more, the Bechimo's construction, built with her strong double-ribbed hull that proven so resilient to Arctic ice, had made her a difficult ship to sink. It's not inconceivable that a combination of her unique position on the ice, coupled with her strong construction, allowed her to survive many years and decades drifting on the top of large ice flows, moving throughout the Arctic much like the Fram or the wreckage of the USS Jeanette. When we're talking about how the Beichimo was able to survive for so long and drift such huge, vast distances within the Arctic Ocean over the course of decades, we always have to keep in mind that a lot of this maybe didn't happen. I don't want to burst anyone's bubble here, but it's important to keep in mind, we know that the Beichimo was trapped in the ice in 1931, and we know that for several years afterwards, it drifted throughout the Arctic Ocean, mainly around Point Barrow, where it was spotted, boarded, and most importantly, photographed by different people at different times and different parties that could corroborate their stories. As the years go on, these stories become more vague, the sightings become much harder to confirm, and the photographs basically entirely dry up. So in the slightly more cynical, less romantic telling of the story, the Beichimo still did something remarkable. It became trapped in the ice in 1931, and then it drifted trapped in this iceberg for maybe seven, eight years. Now, again, it maybe did then drift off further. It could have drifted off into the Arctic Sea and sunk out there. If you want my opinion, I think really what happened to the Beichimo is that around 1937, unfortunately, that sturdy Swedish hull was crushed in the ice and it sank to the bottom of the sea. I think one of my favourite stories from this actually comes from the end when Captain Cornwell, who remember had captained the ship since its time in Siberia, had been there basically the entire time it had been with the Hudson Bay Company, and was interviewed back home in England. He was a bit of a local celebrity at that point because of what had happened with the Beichimo. Um, and he theorised that the ship would probably not sink for many years, and he was right about that. He theorised that it might drift off towards Siberia. Now, Captain Cornwell would return to the Arctic. He says in the interview that he would like to return and he ends up captaining more ships for the Hudson Bay Company. He dies in the 1950s. But in that article, he says that he hopes one day that he might be able to see the Beichimo again. And again, whether or not we know the Beichimo sank later on in the 1970s or maybe sank in the 1930s, it's amazing to think that he was out there sailing ships and somewhere out in the ice was the Beichimo, that ship that he had captained for so many years, now charting its own course as one of the most famous phantom ghost ships of the Arctic. Anyway, 
That is the story of the Beichimo, a really fascinating story that I've always wanted to tell. I actually wrote the script for this and started the research for this the same week I started writing the script for the Kharkov Chanka video, a video which just recently passed five million views, I believe, which is just <laughs> absolutely crazy. I don't think many people are going to be as interested in the Beichimo as they were in the Kharkov Chanka, but I've always been really kind of captivated by it. And if there is one book I would recommend on the story of the Beichimo, it's really the definitive story of the Beichimo, it is, and you're going to be sick of me saying this, The Beichimo, <laughs> Arctic Ghost Ship by Anthony Dalton. A amazing book. I actually have uh, two copies of this. You can see perhaps just how dog-eared and ruined this book is. Um, when I used to work at sea, I had this book and I used to lend it out to people <laughs> because I was like, you should read this book. It's absolutely amazing because the story of the Beichimo, as Anthony Dalton lays out really well, is so much more than that of a ghost ship. The Beichimo was a harbinger, I mentioned before, of a new way of life in the Arctic. It was one of the largest ships to ever arrive to some of these remote communities and it would be for many years and it had pioneered a form of trade and a regular service into the Arctic that hadn't really existed beforehand and I think to me the most amazing thing about the story of the Beichimo that Anthony tells in his book really well is the the changing way of life that the Beichimo represented and brought into the Arctic. I wish I could have talked more about that but I, I wanted to focus more on the the, the life of the Beichimo from start to finish and then maybe what happened to it. Sorry, my dog's acting crazy. Just to make it quite difficult to... You got anything you want to say? Fair enough. But anyway, thank you very much uh, for watching. Been a really fun video. I'm so glad to have finally got this out of the way. It was a difficult video to make because there's not many photos of the Beichimo. I trawled the internet for years to find uh, newspaper clippings and photographs, archive photos, there was no footage of it. Um, my, my dad actually made this incredible paper model. I'll leave a link to this in the description below. You can buy a flat pack paper model kit and assemble it. This one isn't actually finished. The funnel's not on it yet and various bits and pieces. I thought I was going to use this in the video more than I actually did, <laughs> but it's an absolutely amazing model. I wish I had had a chance to feature it um, a little bit more, but Anyway, I think that's it. I am going to go now, maybe see if I can finish this model. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.